Okay, letting more people in. Welcome. And you know, I was going to say, sometimes it might seem a bit like drudgery, like kind of come into class. But I love that kind of, you know, opposite, like excitement, like, you know, not only do you have the opportunity to access higher education, and I was literally just reading a story yesterday about um, girls being poisoned in schools um, in Iran to discourage females from getting an education. And, you know, so sometimes I just reflect on how fortunate we are in this country. And, um, and two, it's just, it's so exciting to actually learn something new. And, you know, I had my moments of epiphanies back when I was in college. It kind of didn't feel like it every day, but sometimes, you know, there would just be a moment of reflection because learning is a very gradual thing, you know, and I would just look back and think, wow, like, I didn't know these things at the start of the semester. And, you know, over time, we do actually learn, you know, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Like a significant amount of skills or knowledge, or we've changed our worldview. You know, this is how like people become doctors and lawyers and engineers and psychologists and, you know, computer scientists and all the other things. Like we were talking in the beginning of the semester, what you guys want to be. Um, and so if it seems hard at times, it's because, you know, when you start, you don't have everything you need to be able to do those careers, you know? But over time, like you actually have the ability to do that. I just, I think it's amazing. You know, I really do. I just, I love academia so much. Um, and it's this, you know, very cyclical process by which human beings pass on their knowledge, you know, so to speak, to the next generations. Um, and let's see, Jamie, it's totally different going to school when you're older. I think you appreciate it a bit more and know how to utilize the knowledge. And that's true, too. Um, I, at least, I mean, it was for me, you know, because you heard my crazy, my childhood, and I didn't go to college right out of high school. Um, you know, I dropped out of high school, and then I went back and got my high school diploma. And then, you know, I'd take a class here and there. It, it was rough. Um, so by the time, by the time, you know, I was going to school full time, um, you know, I was not the traditional college student age, you know, I was like in my late twenties. So, um, and I know a lot of people come back. I mean, I've had students in their seventies. I don't know if I've had you know, I don't know what my oldest student was, but especially when I worked at Long Beach State and I was there almost 10 years um, and I was um, oftentimes teaching future elementary school teachers. And I had a lot of older students who had already done a full career and maybe they were retired from that career and they wanted to go back and teach or maybe midway through their career, they had a change of heart and they wanted to teach. And that's something, right? You can hear my love for education. Um, so I love, you know, I love that. And I love how students have a chance to learn from many different teachers over the course of their lifetime. So if you've ever even considered it, I mean, I wanna maybe even give that an extra little push because we really need people who love education, who can inspire the next generation to want to learn, right? You know, oftentimes I think people go into teaching because they love their own subject, which I think is so important. And at the same time, to teach, we want to be able to love 
you know, inspiring that in other people. And it's just, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing. So I appreciate you guys sharing here too. Let's see, Sashua. I'm a baby boomer on the 50-year plan. I have three adult children. My youngest graduates this May with his engineering degree. That's awesome. Absolutely awesome. Yep. So, you know, education is for everyone. You know, we never stop learning, really. And being in a college or a university, it's just this very, like, concentrated place where the focus really is on that education and it's very transformative right it's not like we're just these empty vessels and knowledge is poured in you know it's a very transformative experience when you learn something new and if your world view has really changed if you know you have changed so I love what I do. And, um, you know, I like, you know, sharing that because I feel like that's, you know, kind of the best way to promote <laughs> education is by attraction rather than promotion, as they say in, in certain groups. Um, but I mean, I think it's very true because, you know, I'm not here to like sell it. Um, you know, you guys come of your own accord because presumably you want to learn. So anyways, I could just talk about these things, but I think it's, it's really important that, you know, we're cognizant of this kind of big overall picture and how like this one class fits into that overall structure. So... Thank you, Sashua. Thanks for saying that. Um, so, and after all that, I want to remind you guys about your exam. <laughs> that was not on purpose, but um, <laughs> it just feels like the, you know, I give it and I take it away or something, but no. So we're here in week four, we're finishing up chapter three, and then your first exam is on Tuesday, and we have, yeah, <laughs> sweet talk to y'all. Um, that's great, Sasha. I, yeah, I think, I think there are some awesome teachers here, really, professors, you know, yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, we have no live Zoom on Tuesday because I'm giving you that class period and really all day to take that exam. So, you know, and for so many reasons, like I don't want you guys to feel stressed. Um, you already have built in time and time and a half or double time, double time. So time shouldn't be an issue. Um you know, it's open book, open note. And even though I have all the practice exams, you know, here on Sunday, I even extended the due date to Monday so you could really practice on that all the way up until midnight on Monday. And then that will close. And then the exam opens. So basically, I don't want both of them open at the same time. So there are no extensions on, you know, the practice exam. But um, yeah, the practice exam will be like your best friend in terms of preparing for the exam. And I'm working on, I haven't quite finished it yet, but I'm working on, um, just move some of these, a practice exam, like hard copy, where I've worked out every problem, you know, even though you can see the, the solutions in there and everything. Um, but just so you have kind of that hard copy and um, I'll upload this in Canvas when I'm done, okay? So there's that. And all right, so let's move along. We're finishing chapter three. 
And the last section, so it's kind of a heavy, you know, chapter with only three sections. And yet, you know, we're spending all today on this one section, measures of variation. So variation refers to when you have a data set, we want to know how do those values vary? How are they spread out? Are they all clustered around, you know, a particular score or scores, or do they spread out? I mean, literally even, what if you're looking at like salaries at a company, you know, are they all like around $40,000 per year, or do they range from, you know, part-time work, 15000 a year up to like $300,000 a year, right? So how do they spread out? And is it just like the outliers or are there lots all spread out? So, you know, so far we have seen two different measures of variation. One is the range. And that's simply the greatest minus the smallest number, right? So like salaries range from 15,000 to 100,000. So 100,000 minus 15,000 is 85,000. So the range of salaries would be 85,000. And we've also seen the interquartile range, which is the upper quartile minus the lower quartile. And if you're looking at a box and whiskers plot or a box plot, it's the length of that box, right? So the upper quartile and lower quartile, that contains 50% of the data. So that gives you some idea of how the data is spread out. Now in this section, we're gonna be concentrating on standard deviation, which is the most common measure of variation or spread. And so the standard deviation is a number, a single number that measures how far data values are away from their mean. So the standard deviation provides a numerical measure of the overall amount of variation within that data set. It can also be used to determine whether a particular data value is close to or far away from the mean. Okay, so I want to remind you for a minute, you know, we've spent a lot of time on in this descriptive statistics chapter you know, talking about measures of center, right? And so let me just kind of emphasize that, you know, I would say the best measure, I would say, to that we want to use. Like I'm, look, I'm looking for the exact word to describe. It's, it's like the ideal measure of center would be a mean, you know? So that gives us, like on average, what is the value, right? That's usually what we kind of want to know. Like, okay, sure, some salaries are 100,000, some are 15,000, but on average, what do people make per year at this company, right? Because maybe there's only one part-timer and maybe only the, like the president or the CEO makes 100,000. But what about everybody else, right? We want to know typically, what a typical person makes or, um, you know, at the end of the day, you're going to probably want to know, like, what is your average exam score, right? It's one thing to know your smallest. It's one thing to know your highest, but on average, like, how are you doing on your exams? What's your average homework score, right? So, um, so the mean is kind of that singular number that gives us an idea of what's typical in a population. Likewise, the standard deviation is that singular number that gives us an idea how the data spread out, what's the variation, okay? So I'm trying to, you know, give it lots of different ways and stuff. Um, Okay, so there are some formulas 
And we're going to walk through these. So please don't be scared. And we're also going to see how we can just use technology to calculate these anyway. Um, but there are formulas. There's, you know, for now, I just want to point out we have two different formulas. One is for a sample standard deviation, and one is for a population standard deviation. Okay, so we have seen, you know, again, usually we want to know something about an entire population, but for whatever reason, it might be difficult, impossible, whatever, costly to, you know, gather the data from everybody or every thing in the population. And so we take a sample. Well, it turns out there are two different formulas. They're basically the same. The only difference is for the sample standard deviation, we're dividing by n minus one, where n is the sample size. And for the population standard deviation, we just divide by the sample size, n. Okay, the number of items in the population. Um, and so remember when you get, you know, one of these values that describes a population, that's a parameter. And one of the numbers that describes a sample, that's a statistic. Okay. So let's start looking at standard deviation. Chapter three, right? And, you know, you guys are aware that I'm really working through all of your homework problems, right? Because I, I did have a student ask me about this um, in class yesterday. And I thought, oh no, am I not being clear enough? Right, this is really your homework. And I'm literally going through every single problem in the homework. Um, and then I post these videos. There is some lag time between class and me posting. And that's because, I mean, first of all, I'll get an email with the file, the link to the file. And sometimes I don't, you know, like, we're recording right now, Thursday. I might not get the email until tomorrow, Friday. And say I get it and I'm in a meeting or, you know, I'm not in my office. Well, by the time I get to it, then I upload it to YouTube. And sometimes it might take, I mean, I've noticed it's taken YouTube sometimes 10 hours or something to process. So I'm just letting you know. There are some lag time between the videos being available. But um, but from last semester, I have everything up. So if you ever wanted to refer back or if you missed a class, you know, I've got everything up, okay? Where I've worked every single problem. So some people keep my video up and their homework up and they'll play me working through a problem and explaining it and then they'll do theirs, you know, and go kind of back and forth. So just sharing that. Okay, okay. We left off. I did 20 population standard deviation. All right, the following are all six quiz stores, scores of a student in a stats course. Each quiz was graded on a six, a 10 point scale. Assuming that these scores constitute an entire population, Find the standard deviation of the population. And this is good that you guys need to really read this because when you pull up your homework, you don't see the title as far as I know. So you have to gather this information from reading the problem. So I want to show you guys how we can walk through this. Um, all right, so we're told that six scores constitute a population and we're asked to find the standard deviation of the population. The calculation for the standard deviation of a population is slightly different than that for a sample. The standard deviation sigma of a population, it's a measure of the spread of the measurements 
of the population about their mean Q. The more that the measurements tend to differ or deviate from the mean, the greater the standard deviation. So a really big number means the data are really spread out. A really small number means the data tend to cluster around the mean. And this kind of explains even more. Um, so the formula for a standard deviation sigma of a finite population involves dividing the sum of the squared deviations from the mean by the size n of the population. This is what I was pointing out in the lecture notes. And the formula for the standard deviation S of a sample involves dividing the sum of those squared deviations from the mean by N minus one rather than by N. And so oftentimes this just kind of trips people up. So I'm really trying to emphasize this. Um, and so, you know, they explain that the sample it's divided by N minus one to give an unbiased estimate of sigma. And so, you know, again, usually we're, we're taking the sample to learn something about the population. So we are calculating a sample standard deviation in hopes of estimating the real population standard deviation. Okay, so dividing by the n minus one, you know, over and over, if you do many samples, the means of those standard deviations will hover on average around the population standard deviation. And division by N instead gives an underestimated guess. Okay, so it just turns out that it works and more advanced classes kind of look at all of that. But for now, just sharing that. And so in the formula, you know, there is a mu or a mean, so we need to start out by calculating this mean. So here, obviously, you could do it by hand, just add them up and divide by six. You could also send to the calculator. And, you know, even though this is a sample mean button, a mean is calculated the same way, whether it comes from a sample or a population. Right, you still just take the sum of all of the data and divide by the number of data. Okay, so that's the six. And then we compute the average of the squared deviations from the mean. So this is the measure of the spread. So we take each value. Like here we have five and we subtract the mean. So this is, that means how, do, how far away from that mean is it, right? You get negative one and then you square it. So when you subtract that, that's the deviation and then you square it. So that's the squared deviation from the mean. And then you add them up and divide by six, and that gives you the average squared deviation from the mean. So you take each value, you subtract the mean, you square it, you take the sum of all of those, and then you divide by the number of values. And we get a number four sixths. That's also two thirds or 0.66666. This gives us what's known as the population variance. Later on in class this semester, we're gonna be looking more at variance. But for now, we're looking at the standard deviation and the standard deviation is actually the square root of the population variance. So we take that result and we take the square root of it. So both the variance and the standard deviation are measures of the spread of a list of measurements about their mean, right? How far out did the data spread away from their mean? However, we often use the standard deviation because the standard deviation has the same units as the measurements. 
and the variance does not. So for example, if your data is in meters, then the standard deviation is in meters, but the variance is squares, so it would be in square meters. So here, we're talking about just points, right? So the average is six points. The standard deviation is approximately 0.82 points, whereas the variation would be, you know, four, six points squared. Yeah, Jamie. Uh, I don't know if I missed it when you were talking, but how did you get the four? That's for the four sixth. This right here? Yes. So that is the result of this calculation. Okay, so if we put it in our calculator, it would say four sixth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or you could even do it by hand, you know, five. I mean, we wouldn't want to, but. Five minus six is negative one. Negative one squared is positive one. That's negative one squared, which is positive one. So now you have one plus one plus one, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I, that's zero. In fact, let's just do it. It's not that bad. So this gives you one. This gives you one. Seven minus six is one. One squared is one. Six minus six is zero. Zero squared is zero. Zero squared is zero. Seven minus six is one, and you square it, and you get one. So you have one plus one plus one plus one. That's four on the top, and then a six on the bottom. That's actually not that bad, that one. Probably easier to do that way than to enter all of that in a calculator, right? As I started looking at it, I'm like, it's not that bad. Um, okay, so this is how to use the formula, right? First, we need to find the mean. Then you take each value, subtract the mean, square it, and then add them all together and divide by the number, and then take the square root. So here's the formula in general right, where these are the data values, x sub one, x sub two, et cetera, all the way up to x sub n. And yes, Lewis and I didn't, were you done, Jamie? Did you want to put your hand down or? Oh, oh, <laughs> okay. I always forget to. So the, yeah. on this, on the, um, on the five minus six squared, that's a minus one. And then you got five minus squared, that's a minus one too, right? So does it, and then you got a couple zeros. And how did, I don't see the, yeah, thank you. So negative one quantity squared, that means you have negative one times negative one. A negative times a negative is a positive. Okay, I see. Yeah. And then, you know, like this one, you get positive one squared and a positive times a positive is a positive. So as long as the signs are the same, when you multiply, you know, two of them, you get a positive. All right, so here's that formula. Right, you've got all the data values. You take each one, subtract the mean, take that result and square it, and then take the sum, divide by n. See, it's nice to see the example first, I think, right? To see how this comes about. And then we could also use this sigma notation because we're taking the summation of each term minus mu squared. Okay. Um, now I wanna show you guys how to do this in Excel. So this is again, a population standard deviation. We can send the data to Excel. 
And I posted an announcement where all students can get Excel for free, right? You guys saw that? All students can get Excel for free. So I recommend that you do that because on certain problems, it's just way easier. So here's the data, six rows there in this one column. And I'm just gonna do equal standard. And notice it starts giving me choices. Notice there's standard deviation P, standard deviation S. So that's for a population, that's for a sample. Okay, so I'm gonna do the one with P. And then, you know, it suggests to you, it prompts you to put the numbers, you know, so you could again highlight all the text. It's showing you up here as well. You could also come up here and type it, you know, but I find it easier to highlight and then enter. You don't even need to close the parentheses and rounding to two decimal places. Easy, right? <laughs> Easy schmeasy. Now, I mean, I think it's good to at least know how to calculate the standard deviations by hand, but then, I mean, by all means, you know, feel free to use Excel. Um, in the calculator in Alex, they only have, this is for a sample standard deviation. They don't have a key for a population standard deviation. Okay, I also want to show you, you know, there's a list of formulas that you can click in every problem. And it's got population standard deviation right there. So you can just pull that up, you know. And so, um, I just want to see if there's one with fewer data here. <laughs> Call me a little lazy, but all right, whatever. Okay, so there are five. Let's calculate the population standard deviation. So we know it's going to be the square root of a great big thing. We need to find the mean. So I'm going to at least send this to the calculator and calculate the mean. The mean is 23. All right, so we take each value, subtract the mean, and square it. Take the next one, subtract the mean, and square it. And the next one, subtract the mean, and square it. And the next one, remember back in the day, we didn't have all this technology, and we had to do everything by hand. Oh, yes, my friends. And then for a population standard deviation, you divide by the number in the population, which is five. And again, it probably pays to do some of the arithmetic first before trying to enter that whole big thing. Um, so 10 minus 13, that's negative 13 squared. And 15 minus 23, that's negative eight squared. And then that's negative two squared. 
and that is positive 10 squared. And that is 13 squared. Feel free to point out any arithmetic mistakes. It's really terrible when I make one <laughs> in a long problem, you know what I'm saying? So again, a negative times a negative is going to give you a positive. And then 13 times 13 is 169. A negative times a negative gives you a positive. Gives you a positive, et cetera, et cetera. And now maybe here we can um, use the old calculator. So let's see, we've got square root of 169 plus 64 plus four plus 100 plus 169 and all of that divided by five. And then round to the nearest, I think it's two decimal places. So it would be 10.06. See if I got it right. I got it right. It's not that bad. But of course, compared to send to Excel, and just do equals standard deviation P, highlight and enter. <laughs> That's way easier, right? You know, I think actually doing them by hand, it really helps to understand, you know, what they mean. You're taking that distance away. Remember when you subtract the difference, it literally means the distance away from the mean. You know, you're taking that, that distance and yeah. Okay, so that's population standard deviation. Here's stand, uh, sample standard deviation. So the Tourist Bureau of the Hawaiian Islands surveyed a sample of five U.S. tourists as they left to return home. The tourists were asked how many days they spent on their visits. So you could find the average number of days and the standard deviation will be, you know, the standard deviation in terms of the number of days. So it's kind of like that typical, you know, variation away from the mean. Anyways, we can send this to the calculator. And again, this button is for the sample standard deviation, which means it's going to be dividing in that square root by n minus 1. Okay. And then you can round to two decimal places and get 2.24. So 2.24 days, and we're going to see, you know, how we make use of that. List of formulas. You could also pull up the sample standard deviation formula. So I'm just letting you know, you know, these, these Alex problems, it's going to be the exact same everything, you know, on the exam. So you'll have access to the formulas, et cetera. You'll have access to the Alex calculator. You'll have access to the explanation. 
I believe though, that once you access the explanation, it counts as one of your two attempts on the problem. I'm pretty sure, you know, so if you do that, it's like, oh, now you know how to do that problem. The answer is 2.24, right? So it's one of your attempts gone. But I think there's a way still to see an example. And, you know, the student view is just different. I should try to, to pull that up. Just see if I if I can see what you guys can see. I'm not sure. Good, Brianna. I'm very glad to hear that. I I think it's great also. I really do. So look at me slacking off. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna pull up the homework and see what it's like. Okay, yeah, see how it says example? You can pull up an example without it costing you an attempt. But the explanation will cost you an attempt. Let's see, does that make sense, you guys? Because if you pull up the explanation, it gives you the answer. You know, so on the test, that'll be one of your attempts and then you know, you get another one, but you can still pull up the example. So that's the bomb, right? So like we're up here, actually, doing the sample Right, find the standard deviation of the sample. So you could just send it to the calculator and do the S sub X, X, which does the standard deviation of the sample. Yes. Lewis, you have a question. Yeah, so uh, which chapter is going to be on the exam? We are just going to have chapters one, two, and three. So exam one, you know, it's on these three chapters. And that's the way all the exams work, you know, these midterm exams. So exam two will be on maybe a different color is better. Chapters four, five, six, and seven, et cetera. So, Yeah, the example is great, for sure. Okay. And, you know, um, so the sample standard deviation, notice there's no sin to Excel. But, you know, if you entered them, Eight, 10, 9, 11. You could do equal standard deviation sample. But I think, you know, since there's the button, 
for the sample standard deviation. And Alex, that's the easier way because you don't have to enter the data and risk making a mistake, right? But so far, so good. We've learned really three ways, you know. And last time we saw on the graphing calculator as well, right? If you enter data into a list, you could do this um, stat edit. You could do the one variable statistics. So I just entered those six numbers, four, six. Oh, guess I made a mistake. Eight. And then I just need a 10. Okay, so I did them in the wrong order now, but I've entered those six numbers, and then you can go to stat, calculate, one variable statistics, or list one, and calculate. And see the S sub X is the 2.61 approximately. It also gives you the population standard deviation. So just pointing this out. So, you know, sometimes you're just like using your handheld. It's all good. All right. We're on 23 and 24 for the sample standard deviation. And then next up, problem 25, the ages of the members of four teams are summarized below, answers the, answer the questions about them. So we've got, you know, team A, B, C, and D, they give us the mean and they give us the range. Based on the information above, which team's ages have the least variability? So the, the only measure that's talking about variability for all of these is the range. So the least variability will be the team that has the smallest range. Right, so that's gonna be team D. And then based on the information above, which team has the oldest members on average? Right, so now you're talking about the mean age. And it wants the oldest. So you're gonna take the one with the biggest mean, which is team C. Does that make sense? Let's see there. Can you explain that again? Yeah, so, you know, when you're talking about variability, right, that's variation. And these are now the three ways we've learned about variation. There's range, there's interquartile range and their standard deviation. Those are the ways we can measure variability. The smaller the range, the least variability. So like team D, it says the range of ages is 12. So like maybe, you know, the ages go from 30 to 42. Right, that's a difference of 12. Whereas, you know, team A, maybe it goes from like 40 up to 58, but it's a wider spread, right? The difference between them is 18. And here the difference between them is 12. Does that make sense? 
So we want the least variability. So that's going to be the smallest number. And then that's when you look at the range. That is the term. That's the number you base on, not the mean, where it said the mean is 44. So the mean we're going to talk about for question B, because this question is asking about the oldest members on average. So on average, right, which team has the oldest members? We're going to look at which ones have the, the highest mean age, right? Team C, the average age on that team is 46. That's way older than 40, right? Sorry, people. <laughs> but does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So here, Alex points out a small range means low variability, and a large range means high variability. And they have some examples where they calculate the ranges. You know, data set A, it ranges from 6 to 13. Right, so the range is seven, and data set B goes from one to 25. That's a range of 24. So data set B has a much higher range or high variability, right? The numbers vary way more. Like if I'm talking about how much something might cost, it might cost anywhere from a dollar to $25 as opposed to somewhere between six and $13. You see what I'm saying? And you can also see, you know, spread out. Sometimes it's nice to visualize, you know, like these items cost between six and $13. And these are way spread out between one and $25. So high variability and low variability. It doesn't vary that much, you know? The prices vary only a tiny bit. Okay, trying to say it lots of different ways, so it kind of makes sense. All right. Right here, salaries of four companies. Um, which company has the lowest salaries on average? So what do you guys think? Which company has the lowest salaries on average? Right, so now we're looking for the smallest mean, right? Which is the 34,000, so that's company C. And then which company salaries have the most variability? So that's going to be the highest range right? The most, the highest variability range. And yeah, that's company D. Okay. All right, number 26. Gadabout Tour Company gave bus tours last summer. The tour director noted the number of people served by each of the 36 tours. The smallest number of people served was 50, 
and the largest was 57. The table here gives the mean, median range, and interquartile range of the data set. So question A asks, select the best description of center for the data set. So when you're looking at the center, right, you're gonna be only focusing on mean and median. These are two measures for center. The range and the interquartile range, remember, these are measures of variation or spread. So select the best description for the center. Based on the IQR, okay, we don't even need to look at the IQR for center, so no. Based on the mean and median, we see that the average number of people served was about 53 or 54. And that's true. Right, this one based on the range. Again, we don't need to look at the range for the center. Okay, so for the spread, you're looking at the range and the interquartile range. So the difference between the largest and smallest number of people served is seven. This is the range and that's true. Right, the difference between the largest and smallest number is 53 and a half. No, it's not the mean and it doesn't indicate anything about the spread. And same here, you know, the number of tour given, tours given does not give you the difference between the largest and the smallest. Okay, so is that good so far for A and B? Questions before I move on? I have a question. Yeah. Okay, when we do this type of problem, we're just looking at the wording of what they're asking. Since they're asking for a center of the data, we know they're talking about the mean and the median and such for the spread where they're talking about the range and the IQR, correct? So we can just process of elimination? Okay. Yep. Yeah. And literally, there's only one statement that's true, you know? So... Yeah, but it's easy to eliminate the other, the wrong ones, you know? So I'm showing you why something is wrong and I'm showing you why something is right because they give the multiple choice, you know? So, okay. Now, when, um, doesn't say it there real quick. Okay, so <laughs> when the mean and the median are the exact same, you end up with a data set that is symmetric. Okay, so in this case, notice the mean and the mean median are both 53 and a half. And so they're asking you select the graph with the shape that best fits the summary values. And so notice here, the data set is symmetric, right? Remember symmetric means it's a mirror image from the left to right sides about a line of symmetry right in the middle. And this one is not symmetric. Right, and notice it says the smallest number was 50, the largest was 57. So this includes the 50 and the 57 also, you know, just saying. Okay, so um, All right, so just sharing kind of the Alex explanations here as well. The center is a typical or an average value of the data set. Right, these are those measures of central tendency, the measures of center that we looked at. 
um, on Tuesday. The mean and the median describe the center. Right, the mean, it's the point where the data set would balance if it were on a seesaw. The median is the middle number if you ordered data from smallest to largest. And then the spread is how much the data values vary. The range and the IQR are each used to measure the spread. Um, the shape is what the data looks like when graphed. We can use information about the center and the spread to help determine the shape. The spread, uh, the shape is symmetric if the right and left sides are mirror images. If the data is symmetric, then the mean equals the median. If the mean does not equal the median, then the data is not symmetric. And I don't mean just close. I mean, they have to literally equal to be symmetric. So the mean and median tell us that the data should be around 53 or 54. You know, graph one has all of that and it has the proper range. Okay, so let's just look at another. I hate the whole fish thing. Let's see if there's another scenario. All right, Ms. Phillips asked her 32 students how many books each had read last summer. The smallest response was 10, the largest was 19. So notice the range is nine, and they're giving you the mean, the median, and the interquartile range. So select the best measure of spread. So for the spread, you're only looking at the range in the IQR. So we can tell by the range that the difference between the largest and smallest number of books is nine. And that's true, just right off the bat. You don't even need to go further. And select the best measure of center. So now you're going to look at mean and me median. We see that a typical student read about 32 books. So that doesn't tell us anything about the center. Um, and it's not the typical number of books read, right? There were 32 students. So that's not even correct. We see that a typical student read about five to nine books by looking at the IQ, R, and the range, and that's not true. It's not true that a typical student read between five and nine books. A typical student read about 16 or 17 books, and we see that by looking at the mean and the median. Okay. And since the mean and the median are not equal, the data is not symmetric. Okay. All right. So let's take a break and when we come back, We'll do 27. Welcome back, you guys. Okay. Mm -hmm. The next topic is on using these back-to-back -back stem and leaf displays 
to compare data sets. And so notice the stem is in the center. And then we have leaves both to the left and the right. So let's see, managers of a sports arena's parking garage keep track of the duration of time customers park their cars in the garage. Shown in the stem and leaf display below is a sample of such parking durations in minutes. For this sample, 18 of the durations were from weekday use of the garage, and 23 were from weekend use. Answer the questions that follow. What were the ranges of parking durations? Which group had the higher median? Which group had more parking durations in the 160s? And so, again, I just want to make sure you guys are clear. So notice the key here, you know, uh, 15 with the two on the left, that means 152 over here. And then the 15 with the four on the right, that means 154. So for example, if I was going to, If I were going to list, say, all of the weekday data, right, there'd be 152, 152, 152, and then 161, sorry, the 162, 164, et cetera, right? So these are all the weekday ones. And so notice if you count the leaves, right? That will tell you like how many data are there. I mean, we know that there are 18, but notice there's one, two, three, four, five, six. And here there's six more, that's 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. <clears throat> because each leaf is the last digit of a number. Okay. So just want to make sure you're okay. And then the right side is just like we've been doing before, you know. If we were to list all the data, you have 154, 154, 155, 158. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. One sixty one. Blah 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 blah. Okay. So to get the ranges, you're just going to take you know the biggest number minus the smallest number. So for the weekdays, the biggest number it's one ninety one. And then minus the smallest number is 152. So that's 39 minutes. And on the weekends, the biggest is 194. And the smallest is 154, a difference of 40 minutes. Okay, so you'd be able to put those in there. And then which group had the higher median? And so now you'd want to calculate the medians for each one. Remember the median basically means the middle number. Okay. So for the weekdays, remember there were 18. There were 18. So you're gonna average the ninth and the 10th durations. So again, knowing how to count you know, by just using the leaves. Let me see if. Um, so even though here they have it on the left, they flipped it around and wrote them on the right here. I don't know why you don't have to do that. Um, But so, you know, they count up to nine, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. 
And then the 10th one is right next to it. So that's 173 plus 176 over two to get the 174 and a half. So you could still count, you know, this way. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and nine and 10, right? So 173 and 176. And then on the weekends, there were 23. So they're using a, uh, yeah. So you want to count up to the 12th, right? So you're going to have 11 below, 11 above, and then the 12th number is right in the middle. So there's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12. So that's 172. And then the question was, uh, which one had the higher median? And so the, the weekdays had the higher median. And then part C was, uh, which one had more durations in the 160s? And so again, the weekdays, there are three. The weekends, there are six. So the weekends had more in the 160s. Okay. So let's see here, the number of minutes customers waited for their orders at two different restaurants. 22 wait times recorded for the first restaurant and 17 at the second. What were the ranges? So for the first restaurant, <clears throat> We've got um, the highest number is 49. And then the smallest number is just nine, right? Notice the key, they show you zero nine just means nine. So these are the tens place in here. So that's gonna be 40. And then for the second restaurant, the biggest one is 47 minus eight. So we've got a range of 39. And then which restaurant had the greater median wait time? So there were 22 for the first restaurant. So that means, you know, if you divide that in half, you're going to have 11 and 11. So we need to average the 11th and the 12th. So for the first restaurant, you need to take the 11th and the 12th and average them. So that's one. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, and twelve. So you've got twenty two and twenty three. So the average is twenty two and a half. And then for the second, there were seventeen recorded. So you want eight above, and then it's going to be in the ninth place, right? It's going to be in the ninth place. So one and four is five, six, seven, eight, nine. So that's 25. <clears throat> so which restaurant had the greater median? It would be the second restaurant. Which restaurant had more wait times from 10 to 19 minutes? 
So that's where the stem here is one. So the first restaurant, right, had seven, and the second had four. So it's the first restaurant. Okay. That's good. Okay, comparing standard deviations without calculation. So remember standard deviations, you know, give you one number to tell you like basically how far away from the mean you are. And the bigger the number, the more the data is spread out away from the mean, the smaller the number, it's clustered more around the mean. So graphs that are closer to the mean are going to have lower uh, sigmas, standard deviations. Okay, so I'll show you how they do this comparison. So they say first compare A and B. Right. <clears throat> so in gray, they have the, you know, the boxes or the squares that are the same. And in red, they show the ones that are different. So like notice here, there's a red one on top of the seven. And in B, that red one is to the right, it's an eight. And here, this third one over nine, in B, it's moved to the right. And same here, you know, you can see how this is moved over and that's moved over <clears throat> from when you're going from A to B. And so A is more closely clustered around the mean. And so A has a smaller standard deviation. Right here, like that one, it's moved farther to the right. It went from seven to eight. And here that nine, it went from nine to 10. That's farther away from the mean, which is in the middle. So questions on just this part. You guys are good. So we know, you know, sigma sub A is less than sigma sub B. And then they compare B and C. And again, they have in gray, the ones that are the same and in red, the ones that are different. Okay, so notice in C, you know, like this one that's here in four, it's like it was moved up to five, and this one was moved up from eight to seven, you know, up higher. <laughs> like I'm picturing literally stacking the blocks. And so C, it's more clustered around the beam. So C has a lower standard deviation. So it's to the left of that is less than, right? Sigma sub C is less than <clears throat> sigma sub B. Okay, so now we know both, you know, sigma sub A and sub C are less than B. So now you have to compare the A and the C to see which one is lower. And again, you know, the ones that are the same and the ones that are different. So A is more clustered around the mean. So A is less. So we have the A, C, B. Okay.
So you add in the um, the blocks that's um, on the like say the left side of the the mean. So we adding those up, or how? We're, we're not adding them. We're comparing them. Right. The graph in A is just a different graph than the graph in C. And what we're doing is we're comparing, right? It, they're histograms. So this means like there are, you know, if I wrote out all the data in data set A, you have three threes, you have two fives. You see what I'm saying? Like maybe these were scores on quizzes or something. You have two sevens and you have three nines. And we're comparing that graph for that data set with this one. And here you have one, two, you have two threes, et cetera, et cetera. You have two fives, two sevens, two nines, and one ten. And so in gray, I have the data that are the exact same. And the only numbers that are different are the red ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so in data set A, you know, we have that number three that's different. Here we have the two, you know, those are the two different ones. In data set A, you have three nines. In data set C, you only have two nines, and the other one's a 10. And so when you look at the difference between these two, you know, the, the red ones are the differences. The gray ones are the exact same in both sets. So what's different with these red ones as opposed to these red ones is for data set A, the red ones are closer to the mean. Look at three and nine are closer to the middle. Here, two and 10 are farther away from the middle. They're more spread out. Does that make sense? Okay, so if you compare A and B, you know, right off the top, I see, you know, like the two towers here in five and seven. Those are the same. Right. And then I have a two, I have a two, I have a 10, and I have a 10. And so what's different is here I have a four and here I have a three, here I have an eight and here I have a nine. So again, I'm looking at what's closer to the mean. The mean is in the middle. While I'm here, right in that one too. So you see the four and the eight are closer to the middle than the three and the nine. <clears throat> so ones that are closer are less, have, have a smaller standard deviation. So I know sigma sub A is less than sigma sub B. And then, like, where's my eraser? Okay.
So I can compare uh, B and C. Right, I've got a two, I've got a two, I've got two fives, I've got two fives, I've got one three, I've got one three, I've got two sevens, two sevens, a nine and a ten. Right. <clears throat> and so what's different is that, you know, here you've got these two on top and here they're off farther away from the mean, right? Five and seven is closer. So sigma sub B is less than sigma sub C. And so in this case, you know, we're already done. A is less than B, B is less than C. So you've got A, B, C here. It's nice when it works out that way. Okay. All right. All right, approximating the standard deviation of a data set given a histogram. To help determine the most effective way for us to advertise our new supermarket, we've hired a consulting firm to investigate coupon use when coupons are mailed directly to individuals' homes. The consulting firm has purchased the following histogram, which summarizes the coupon use information, the daily percentage of customers who use at least one coupon in a purchase, purchase for each of the past 48 days. So based on this histogram, estimate the standard deviation of the sample of 48 percentages. Okay, so you've got four between three and 5%, eight between five and 7%, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'll show you the Alex version here first. <clears throat> So we're going to make use again of the midpoints. And we did this before when we were just calculating um, an approximate mean, right? Because we don't know exactly how many were between three and five. We just know that there were four somewhere in there. You know what I'm saying? We don't know exactly what these four are is what I mean to say. Um, so an individual data value can be estimated as the midpoint of the class, right? So we're just estimating. We're saying that there are four. We don't know exactly what these four are, but we're just going to give them all the value of the midpoint. We don't know what each one of these eight are, but we're just going to give them all the value of the midpoint. So the mean can be estimated by taking, you know, four of those plus eight of those plus eight of those, et cetera. And altogether there are 48. So you add all those up and divide by 48. And then for the standard deviation, this is where we're making use of frequency, right? Remember you take the value minus the mean mu, take the difference and square it, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, take the sum. And so, you know, if you had four individual ones, you could do all of those individually, but instead we're just saying we have four that are approximately that. So you have four of those, that's multiplication. So this is that, and this is a sample. So again, we wanna be careful. Um, that we're going to use the sample standard deviation and not the population deviation. Um, 
So we're going to divide by the sample size minus one. Right. Let me see. I wanted to just show you guys in the list of formulas. Estimated standard deviation of group data. So this is where you have the frequency times the midpoint minus the sample mean, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, you know, it's the, the estimated sample mean or using the sigma notation. Um, I want to show you how we can still do this using Excel. Why? So, I mean, we know how to do a standard deviation formula if we had each individual data value. And so now we don't have each individual data value, but we have, you know, estimates. So I have four of these that are four. Actually, I'll do it up here. I'll just use this random column, okay? Or I guess I can delete all these. Okay, so I'll use A. So this is as if I have four of these fours. And then I have eight that are six. You see what I'm saying? I have eight that are eight. Now, an easy way, instead of, you know, especially you don't want to enter 16 times, maybe. So remember, it has that little um, dark corner. And if you put your cursor over that, you can drag to copy. If you have just a number in that cell, it'll copy the number. If it has a formula in the cell, it'll copy the formula. So I need eight of those. So right now, <clears throat> I'm in row 13. If I want eight, you know, 13 plus eight is 21. But I'm going to subtract where I started. So I'm going to go up to row 20. And notice that's one two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then I need 16 tens. So there's a 10. I'm in row 21. So 21 plus 16 is 37. And then subtract one for where I'm starting. So I'm going to go down to row 36. So click the cell, drag it. Okay, those are my 16 tens. And then I have 12 twelves. So I'm in row uh, 37, I need 12 of them. So that's 49 and then subtract one. So I wanna end up at row 48. Okay. So again, we don't know exactly what these are, but we're estimating them to be 12. So now I have my 48 data values. And I can do the sample standard deviation on them. 
So it's the one with the S. And then you can highlight all the data. And there you go. So it's asking you what for one decimal place. So 2.5. Okay. So I kind of like this. It saves you from doing, you know, these calculations by hand. Okay, so between zero and 40, let's see, there are dozens of personality tests. One test scored on a scale of zero to 200 is designed to give an indication of how personable the test taker is with higher scores indicating more personability. And suppose that a group of 48 classmates has taken this test and is summarizing the score the scores in this histogram. So based on the histogram, estimate the standard deviation. So between zero and 40, there were four. And then let's look at the midpoints. Because we don't know exactly what those four people scored. So we're just gonna estimate, you know, the midpoint is 20. And then between 40 and 80, there were eight, eight people. And so the midpoint is 60. Between 80 and 120, there were 16 people. And so the midpoint is 100. Between 120 and 160, there were 12 people, right? The midpoint is 140. And between 160 and 200, uh, there were eight and the midpoint is 180. Does that make sense? So again, we're just estimating like all 16 of those people scored 100. And so we can just make use of Excel. I'll delete all that. So you have four 20s. That's not bad. And then you have eight 60s. Plus eight is 13, minus one is 12. And you have 16 hundreds. 16 and 13 is 29. So we're gonna go to 28. And then you have 12 one forties. And you have eight 180s. Does that make sense? So it's like we're literally estimating these eight people all scored 180. And this is a sample standard deviation. And notice we ended on row 48, so that's good. It's a good check. OK. 
Okay, at least one decimal place, so 47.0. Okay. So questions before moving on? Or thumbs ups? <laughs> okay. Okay, so next up is the empirical rule. And so here's the deal, okay? If you have a data set that is called approximately normal, then that means the data set looks like this bell-shaped curve. And we're able, we know lots of things about data that have this kind of shape that have a distribution that is approximately normal. Um, one of the things we know is that it follows the empirical rule, which says, you know, that mean mu is in the middle. And then if you go out one standard deviation from the mean in either direction, 68% of all the data lies in that area. And then 95% lie within two standard deviations. And 99.7% of all data lies within three standard deviations. So this is why knowing the standard deviation tells us what the shape of that curve looks like. So I don't have a lot of room here, but imagine here's the mean. And, you know, if sigma is really small, one sigma is there, add another sigma, add another sigma, you know, 99.7% of all the data are going to be within those three. And so the data is tightly clustered about the mean, as opposed to if sigma is really big, you know, like maybe I can't even draw it out that far. <laughs> There's one sigma, two sigmas, and three sigmas, one, two, and three. And so now, you know, you have a much flatter curve. Oops, <laughs> not that flat is what I'm saying. So the standard deviation, you know, tells you a lot about what a curve looks like. Is this making sense so far? Uh, I have a question. So if the standard deviations are closer together, then, then you'll have like the bell curve is what you're saying. But if, if all, they're further all apart, of, apart. All of these are bell curves, despite my, my bad hand drop <laughs> writing there. <laughs> So it's just that this is a bell that's more flattened out, you know, like that. And this is a bell that's more, you know, tight. They're all bell-shaped curves as long as you have a normal distribution. And this empirical rule, you know, is true. It's just that length of the standard deviation tells you you know, how far the data gets spread out. Okay. So, 
Okay, so like for up till right now, we've just been figuring out what one standard deviation is, correct? Correct. So this is we like just compiling found the more than one. Well, we found the value for the standard deviation. So like, and we're going to look at lots of different examples. But, you know, notice this graph. It just has a generic mu, a generic mu plus sigma. But, you know, if you have numbers, like maybe mu is 52, and maybe you've calculated sigma to be like 3.5. I mean, that's just telling you one standard deviation to the right. You add 3.5. So now you've got 55.5 right there. Et cetera, et cetera. You know, add another standard deviation. But so far, we've just calculated what the value of sigma is. So like here, these, these have um, some numerical examples. Mary is a budding climate scientist and is analyzing historical data on the noontime temperature on each of two dates date one and date two for each of the last 77 years at a weather station in Texas. The histograms below show the distributions of the two data sets. Each histogram shows temperature in degrees Celsius on the horizontal axis and the number of years on the vertical axis. The means and the standard deviations are also included. Okay. Um, so Mary wants to use the empirical rule to make some approximations about both data sets. Unfortunately, you can only use the empirical rule on only one data set. And it's the one here that looks more like a bell-shaped curve. You see what I'm saying? Doesn't have to be perfect. This one clearly is not bell-shaped though, okay? So we can't use the empirical rule on date two, but we can on date one. Well, it says the percentage of temperatures between 10.74 and 40.98 is approximately what? And so we can, See what's going on based on the mean and the standard deviation. Because we know that 68% will fall within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% will fall within two standard deviations of the mean. And 99.7 will fall within three standard deviations of the mean. So 25.86, the mean is about right there. Now, if you add 5.04, that gives us one standard deviation to the right, and that's 30.88, which is almost right in the middle here. Right, and so, just to kind of highlight this a bit, that was the mean here. So that's one standard deviation to the right. If you add another standard deviation, you end up at 35.92. That's about here to the left of 36. You add another standard deviation and you get the 40, did I make a mistake somewhere? I must have done. I'm always tempted to say where. Oh, I see I started off wrong with a typo. 
So my bad, 25.86 plus 5.04. It's 30.9. And then plus 5.04. It's 35.94. And then plus another standard deviation. 40.98. Right, so that's the length of one standard deviation. That's the length of one standard deviation. So that's three standard deviations to the right. And then you do the same thing basically to the left, but now you're subtracting one standard deviation at a time. Or you could start by taking the mean and subtract three standard deviations. You know, it doesn't matter what order. It's easier for me to kind of do one at a time. Right? You could subtract 5.04. And you're at 20.82. And then subtract another one. You get 15.78. And you subtract another one. And you get 10.74. Right, so again, that's one standard deviation. That's one standard deviation. That's one standard deviation. So they're asking what percentage of temperatures were between 10.74 and 40.98. And so those are, you know, all the temperatures within three standard deviations of the mean. So that's 99.7%. And approximately 68% are within one standard deviation of the mean. So we've calculated that. Of course, I can't read my handwriting very well. <laughs> but whatever 30.9 and 20 point something. 20.82 and 30.9. Okay. So let's see, Jim is doing research on organic farming. We're an agricultural foundation. He's collected data on the number of oranges harvested from two different orchards. In each orchard, the number of oranges harvested was 63 trees. From each of 60 trees, from each of 63 trees. So you've got two different data sets. Orchard two is the only one that resembles a bell-shaped curve. Okay. And so I'm going to bring up the Alex explanation because I want to try and get through all these topics. All right, but we're just using that idea again, and you can just calculate the mean plus, you know, one, two, and three standard deviations, or the mean minus one, two, and three standard deviations. So we can only use orchard two. Um, So the percentage of oranges between 203.1 and 363.9 turned out to be the 99.7% because it was plus or minus three standard deviations away. And then again, 68% were between 
256.7 and 310.3. So that's the mean plus or minus just one standard deviation. Okay. Let's see. The annual amounts of rainfall in a certain region are modeled using the normal distribution shown below. The mean is 36.5 centimeters. So the mean is always below the highest peak. Okay, it's right in the middle. And a standard deviation is 5.2 centimeters. So in the figure, V is the number along the x-axis and it's under the highest part of the curve. So we know that's the mean. And U and W are numbers along the X, the axis, the X axis even, that are the same distance away from that mean. So use the empirical rule to choose the best percentage of the area under the curve that's shaded. So we know that the standard deviation is 5.2. So if I add one standard deviation to the mean, I've got 36.5 plus 5.2. That gives me 41.7. So look at the axes here. That's going to be right here close to the 40. Right? So that's one, you know, sigma away. And then add another sigma of 5.2. And now you're at 46.9. And notice, looks like it's about right there. So 46.9. And so that's two sigmas away. And then we can do the same thing going the opposite direction. So we have 36.5. And you might as well just subtract two times that sigma value of 5.2. 36.5 minus two times 5.2 is 26.1. So, I can just enter that there. And so I know that's within two plus or minus two sigmas on both sides. So that's the 95%. Okay. So these are all the same idea, just kind of worded a little bit differently. And here we have lengths of movie files with a normal distribution. You've got the mean and the standard deviation. And so you can just, you know, add and subtract. In Alex, they show you doing, you know, just all three on both sides, adding one, two, and three, and then subtracting one, two, and three of them. You know, I say as soon as you've filled in enough to answer the question. I mean, really, you're done, right? You add one standard deviation and you get to that number that's between 180 and 200. And then you can subtract one standard deviation to get the 151.1. So within one standard deviation, it's 68% of the data. Um, same exact idea, and now it's just uh, in a word uh, problem instead of a graph. Was that a question or just? I'm going to mute everybody just in case, but feel free to come off mute. 
Okay, so the mean cranial capacity for men is 1,050 cubic centimeters and a standard deviation is 300. So what percentage of men have cranial capacities between 450 and 1650? So you just wanna find out how many standard deviations away those are from that mean. So you've got a mean of 150, right? You can add one standard deviation, another standard deviation, et cetera. And so it's within two standard deviations that you get to 1650 on the right and you subtract two standard deviations to get to 450 on the left. So that's 95%. And then find the range of cranial capacities for 68%. So that's plus or minus one standard deviation. So you can add 300 and subtract 300. Okay, so again, same exact idea, you know, just written in that word problem format. All right, now finding a Z value, a Z score. So a Z-score is what we call a number that tells you how many standard deviations away from the mean you are. So I just wrote two examples here, random examples. Like if Z equals 1.25, you know, that's a number that is 1.25 standard deviations away from the mean. So it's, you know, more than one standard deviation, it's over here. If, if you have a z-score that's negative 2.3, that's negative, you know, it's 2.3 standard deviations to the left. So it's negative over here. So a z-score is a number that tells you how far away from the mean you are. And to calculate a z-score, It's whatever data value minus the mean divided by sigma. So the value minus the mean over the standard deviation. Okay, so the year Heather graduated college, she got a job as an entry level software engineer. Her starting salary was 64,500. That's her data value. For the year she graduated, the starting salaries of all entry-level software engineers had a mean of 63,000. So that's the mean and a standard deviation of 2770, that's sigma. Find the Z-score of her salary. So the Z-score, it's X minus mu over sigma. So it's 64,500 minus 63,000 over 2770. And you can just do that on a calculator. And that gives you the Z score. So it's about 0.54. So that means if you were to draw a normal distribution, you know the mean salary is 6,300, a 63,000. You know, she's to the right of that by 0.54. Standard deviations away, you know? So it's a little more than one uh, half of one standard deviation to the right. That's her salary. So she knows she's, you know, better than the mean. How much better, you know, it gives some indication. All right, here's the same idea with the mean home price, a standard deviation, 
And then Josh and his family paid that. So you can take that data value minus the mean and divide by the standard de deviation. And here, you know, he, pri he paid or they paid more than two standard deviations below the mean. So it gives an indication of that value, like where it would be in relation to the mean. Like it was a good deal, right? It was a really good deal. All right, um, I'm just avoiding the fish. Uh, DeAndre is in his first semester at a certain university and is taking a calc class with a large enrollment. He just took the first midterm exam and is nervous about his score. The mean on the exam was 67. Standard deviation is three. And he scored 62, find the z-score. So his z-score, it's his score minus the mean over the standard deviation. So 62 minus 67 divided by three, round to two decimal places. So negative 1.67. Now fill in the blanks to interpret what his score means or is. So DeAndre's exam score was 1.67 standard deviations below the mean. Right. Notice I don't put the negative here. We're talking about how many of those standard deviations above or below the mean. So that's all these are asking you to do. Like Pilots Association found the members have a mean of 3,160 one hours of flight experience, standard deviation. Um, Kayla has 4,192 hours of flight experience. Find the z-score. So you'd subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. 1.59. And so that means her flight experience is 1.59 standard deviations above the mean because it's positive. Okay. And then the last topic, like <laughs> um, New Park Stars and Sunny Valley Hoops are two local youth basketball leagues. Last season, the total points scored per player for the New Park Stars had a mean of 389, standard deviation, blah, blah, blah. And then the data for the Sunny Valley Hoops. For each league, the distribution of total points scored was clearly bell-shaped. So we know that we can use these empirical rules, we know that z-scores apply. So find the z-scores of each. And so just in the interest of time, I'm gonna pull them up. We know how to calculate a z-score. You just subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviation. So Gina's z-score and uh, Jane's z-score. So next up, who was the lower scorer relative to her population? So, you know, on her own team or whatever, who's doing better, or in this case, who's doing worse? Since they're both bell-shaped, we can make that comparison, okay? Otherwise, you can't. If they're not normal distributions, you can't do a comparison. 
But so in this case, the one with the lower score, you know, did the worst. They're way out to the left. And so um, Jane, you know, had the lower score. So she did worse in her league. Maybe we have time for, for one more. Aquarium of Sharks. Um, again, the distribution is bell-shaped for both of these aquariums and both of these, um, you know, populations, female sharks and male sharks. So find the z-scores for each one of those. And again, in the interest of time, you just subtract the mean and divide by the standard deviations. And then um, find which one is smaller relative to its population. Okay, so Arturo has that negative z-score. So compared to the population, he's way less than the mean, whereas Lydia is greater than the mean. So Arturo is smaller compared to the population, relative to the population. Okay, and whew, we just finished. So, um, yay. Again, look out for, you know, I'll be posting this. I'll post an announcement when I have finished the practice exam. But otherwise, happy studying and good luck on your exams on Tuesday. Let me know if I can help you with anything, okay? Don't forget, we have all the free tutoring at the Math Success Center 24-7. You guys, take advantage of that. I never had access to free tutoring, <laughs> ever, ever. All right, have a great day, you guys. So we don't come to class.